It's been a crazy few months in the quantum computing world. A lot happened in 2024, and the end of the year was quite a spectacle. In this video, I want to talk a little about the spectacle that was Willow. If you clicked on this video and haven't heard of Willow, I'd be surprised. But just in case, Willow is Google's latest superconducting quantum chip, which made substantial headlines in December when they made a big PR push around it. There has already been a massive amount of analysis and discussion regarding this chip, uh, and since everyone else was chiming in, I figured I'd give my two cents. Uh, in this video, I'll share a few things that might not have come up in other contexts or that some people who only saw the original Google announcement might be unaware of. The first thing to note is that the Willow announcement did actually catch me by surprise, and probably a fair amount of other people. But not because the results were unexpected or particularly notable, but because the key nature paper that they were basing the announcement on was not new. Uh, it was standard practice in the quantum industry to post papers on, on archive, then update them upon journal revisions. And this exact paper was published on archive in August. So uh, of course, getting published in Nature was new, but the paper itself has been out for months. And it was already read and commented on by the scientific community for months before the big Willow announcement. And in fact, racked up dozens of citations uh, other people writing papers that explicitly cited this uh, Willow paper before the press release for Willow came about. So in scientific terms, it was a bit of old news that was getting all of this publicity. The, the second thing to remark is that this result, even in the original paper, was not an exceedingly unexpected result. Achieving improvements in error correction for quantum computers is both necessary and expected for furthering quantum research. The timing and results published align pretty well with multiple companies' roadmaps and development timelines that you see uh, all these companies putting out. The third thing is that this chip doesn't solve all of the problems that quantum computing is facing. You might see the press release and say, okay, now we just have to scale manufacturing and we're there, we solved quantum computing, but it's pretty far from that. It seemed somewhat inevitable that improvements in error correction would happen if you just extrapolate from some of the current work that already showed uh, improvements based on using error correction and combine that with the regular improvements in hardware that happen every single year, improvements in error correction and advantages of using error correction are pretty inevitable it seems. But one of the biggest challenges right now facing quantum computing is getting from where we are now to a useful quantum computer and the challenges that come with scale. And one thing you might think is the challenge of scaling qubits. So, you, you know, reading this announcement saying, oh, Google showed us that if you add more qubits, you basically get a better quantum computer. So just print a bunch of qubits, right? I mean, we have these silicon wafers that, you know, have, have trillions of transistors out there in the world. And so, you know, just, just send that over to uh, TSMC and we'll get back, you know, a, a ton of qubits. Unfortunately, that's not quite how it works. There's quite severe limitations to chip sizes. This is something that's been discussed pretty extensively by companies like IBM and IonQ, which is that there's a limitation to how much you can put on a single quantum chip. So what does that mean practically? That means that you can't just make a chip unlimitedly large um, for quantum computers in most modalities. This is true for IBM, which uses superconducting chips just like Google, or IonQ, which uses trapped ions, which is a, a different modality of harnessing quantum effects, but the end result is the same, that you cannot just print more qubits on a single chip. Now, exactly why depends slightly on the modality, Practically, for example, with superconducting, you have a lot of overhead that comes from piping in control wires for all of these qubits and interactions, and you also have to maintain the chip at a certain core temperature, uh, which limits the size that you can make a single chip of. There's, other, there, there's many other constraints as well that we won't go into now, but making a massive chip of, say, a, a million qubits is probably not feasible. 
Uh, so one of the big things that other companies were looking into is, is these quantum interconnects where you have multiple quantum chips that you then hook together, basically. Um, and so this is achievable in a variety of ways. At first, of course, you can just connect them via classical connections, but there was research done in, in quantum coherent connections. So you maintain uh, the quantumness across these wires, basically. Now, obviously, this is this is a high level description of it, but it's not conceptually divergent from how modern GPU training works, which requires fast, uh, you know, InfiniBand connections for large scale multi chip training because you have to move a lot of digital data across GPUs very fast in order to train these distributed models. Now, of course, this is all classical data and we're in the quantum realm, but the idea is, is similar. So all that is to say the question of how do I take what Google did and go and make a big chip that is actually useful uh, is still an open question that those problems are still remain to be solved. So I'm not dismissing any of, of Willow's accomplishments. This was a necessary and important step in, in the progress of quantum computing development, but it was neither unexpected nor particularly incredible as far as changes in advancements go. For example, you might think, oh, this is a massive leap ahead. This is an inflection point for quantum computing. Maybe it will be, but as it currently stands, most of the problems are still wide open. And so connected to that, right, is that this chip is not necessarily miles ahead of its peers. If you look at this blog post, right, that that they put out, you'll look at this graph and think, especially if you notice the log scale, right? And you'll say, oh my gosh, this is like, that's a lot better than everything else, right? This especially since there's orders of magnitude difference. Um, but there's some important caveats to that claim. The first is that this graph doesn't actually include what is arguably their biggest competitor, competitor which is IBM Quantum, uh, probably because IBM doesn't use cross entropy benchmarking and thus uh, they use uh, different uh, methods for evaluating their quantum chips, some of which we can go into later. Uh, but we can also compare some of the values of these chips without actually looking at the results. Uh, for example, here are Willows and IBM Quantum's published data sheets. This is just uh, one of the IBM's publicly available chips that I grabbed their information from. So there might be better IBM chips or they might have published later and, and, and greater, you know, uh, results that I that I don't know off the top of my head. But this is, you know, just a sampling to show. So if we look at the T1 time of both chips, which is basically just a measure of how long your qubits last. Uh, so you want that number to be as high as possible. Um, you can see, of course, IBM has this higher T1 time. Uh, the single and two qubit error rates, uh, the, the big thing in, in getting error rates down is, of course, the two qubit error rates. Recent results have shown actually single qubit error rates of like close to 10 to negative seventh. Uh, so two qubit is, is definitely the real challenge here. Um, but they have similar error rates in both one and two qubit gates. Uh, the measurement error is pretty similar. They do have different topologies that's not being shown. Google has a higher degree of qubit connectivity on average because they have a grid, whereas IBM uses a, a heavy hexagon sort of lattice. Uh, but either way, the point is that these technologies are pretty comparable and uh, neither would be described as, you know, a milestone way ahead of the other one. The other point to remark is that this graph that they put out is already out of date. Uh, when this announcement was made uh, by Google, this this graph was was you know an accurate representation. But seven days after the Willow announcement, the ZCZ team, which is just a research group in China, published their paper on ZCZ three, which is their latest uh, superconducting chip. And if you look at the plot, you can see. You know, seven days later, we already have a superconducting computer that's, you know, beating Willow. So, you know, very quickly, um, state of the art has moved beyond Willow. And so, at least in this specific benchmark, of course, there's lots of valid discussion about how good this benchmark is, other ways of comparing quantum chips. Um, but, you know, you can definitely say that that chip probably did not get as much hype as Willow did. Uh, I will leave you 
to estimate why that's the case. And the last thing I'll say that that's definitely been lost, I think, in some of the hype, uh, especially in some of the hype regarding the stocks, is that this chip, Willow, much like their first chip, Sycamore, uh, which is which quote unquote achieved quantum supremacy, uh, is not commercially relevant. Uh, in fact, the the original chip, which is said to have achieved quantum supremacy, and and this is actually exactly what they said about it here. Our first chip, Foxtail, in 2017, followed by Bristlecone in 2018, and Sycamore in 2019, which powered our milestone one. The first quantum computer to surpass the best classical supercomputer on a computational task, random circuit sampling. Over the not only is it not a supremacy chip, Researchers have actually been able to simulate the experiment they did in a mere 86.4 seconds, which is actually an order of magnitude faster than the quantum computer took. So not only is Sycamore, you know, the times have come down on classical computing to uh, show what uh, the comparison is, but also classical computing is literally faster at being a quantum computer because that's really all the task is of random circuit sampling. Than, a, than the Sycamore quantum computer is. So the, their quantum computer is worse at being a quantum com computer than GPUs, at least Sycamore was. Now, Willow is, is another question, but you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the, uh, to the research community to determine how long it'll take for these, uh, for these chips to be simulated. Uh, here you can see uh, you know, a comparison of a lot of claims of advantage that have panned out as being eventually simulatable so we'll have to see we'll have to see how this one turns out now on the last point there's a lot of potential discussions that are relevant here such as what is this cross entropy benchmarking and, and is it a useful metric how do we actually benchmark quantum computers and, and evaluate them such that we can avoid failing some sort of teapot test um, how long is it until chips can be simulated classically? What's the state of other modalities going into 2025? There's a lot of you know, discussion that, that we can have regarding these topics, but I'm going to leave most of that for future videos depending on interest. Before I go, though, I, I will draw your attention to one last thing in the announcement blog. There's a claim that the experiment, and I quote, lends credence to the notion that quantum computation occurs in many parallel universes in line with the idea that we live in a multiverse, a prediction first made by David Deutsch. Now, this is, uh, to be candid, in my opinion, a somewhat baffling claim, and it somewhat boggles the mind how it made it through any sort of uh, internal review. Uh, to be clear, the experiment that they're referencing right here is the uh, random circuit sampling benchmark, which is literally an experiment that tests how good a quantum computer is at sitting at a desk and behaving like a quantum computer. So to be clear, like what is the task it's computing? It's computing the evolution of it being a quantum computer. Now, maybe there, there's obviously fair you know, nuance here in like what is the nature of computation and analog computing and all of that. But I'm just going to compare it to this is sort of a, a common test that people now have talked about the marmalade test or something like that as if people are saying oh uh the you know when when you make toast in the morning because that's extremely difficult right simulating the aerodynamics and the fluid dynamics of heat transfer between metal and uh, you know bread and how heat applies and transforms its bread. I mean, if you wanted to simulate that, you couldn't realistically like down to the atomic level. That would be an intractable computation to do. But, you know, your toaster is able to do it every morning. Um, and so, ergo, because your toaster can compute something and also give you bread that classical computation cannot do, at least currently, then that proves there's a multiverse, which, of course, is, is, is somewhat laughable. Um, now, of course, Google does have a history of being irresponsible, uh, to be polite, I guess, when it comes to scientific communication, so much so that prominent scientific communicators have, have explicitly called them out before. But uh, I will leave it to the cynics to look at the claims made in Willow and, you know, 
related stock price events and ask why it was that these claims are made because usually the cynics are right. So now that's the end of the video. Now there is actually an epilogue here, but I'm just going to say a few things uh, going into 2025, which is that hopefully you can tell in this video that there was more effort put into scripting and editing than usual. Normally my videos are done in an unscripted single take and then uploaded without editing. This allows me to make them quickly and without hassle, but lowers the quality of the videos. Now, it doesn't necessarily lower uh, the quality of the content, but how it's being conveyed. Now, clearly that didn't accelerate my video making much since I only produced three videos last year. So I'm trying out some new things this year. I'm also planning on branching out into other fields. I have videos I'm editing on philosophy, machine learning, food, and more. Uh, so we'll have to see how this turns out. But if, if the benefits of the style uh, don't, don't yield any improvements or, or viewer perception is, is strictly negative, I'm also happy to just switch back to the older sort of uh, more grunge aesthetic, I guess, of videos. Um, but I wanted to try this out and see see if people like it. I have some animations coming, you know, sort of quasi inspired by three blue, one brown. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what pans out, but, you know, I'm happy to try out new things and, and see what comes of them.